One of the most common punches in a fight is called a haymaker punch, that big old swinging punch. This video is gonna teach you how to deal with that, whether you're big or small. All right, let's get warm, right? We're on those ladders, single foot, single ladder, one foot in the ladder, just basically warming your joints up, warming those ankles up. On the way back, he's monkey crawling. Remember, knees in alignment with your elbows. Just move at your own pace so you feel nice and comfortable, okay? If you guys are at home and you don't have ladders, just do it in the spot, high knee, okay? Do like 10 of those and then go into your monkey crawl position. And if you need to, just a couple forward and a couple back, even if you have limited space, still means that you guys can train at home. Next time through, we're gonna be focusing on double ladder. Okay, so now it's almost like a jog, single foot, two ladders, right? On the way back, he's doing what's called a reverse crab walk, butt nice and low on the palms, go on your knuckles if it hurts your wrist a little bit. Your goal here is to move away from your attacker as fast as you can. If you guys are at home, let's make that a little bit more of a jog now. Knees a little bit lower, just jogging, just warming our body up. Third time through on the ladder with that reverse crab walk. See if you can go fairly quick on your way when you're standing up. Try and do that tactical stand up like Chris is doing a great job of. Single foot triple ladder now. He's stretching it out. Why are we running? Because running is a huge part of self defense. On the way back, he's going to be doing what shrimping. Notice how he bridges up, moves his butt to the side. He's trying to travel across the room. Okay. If you're at home by yourself, you're pumping those knees nice and high, getting into that on the spot jog now. Okay. Again, do about 10 or 15 of those. On the way back, you're doing that shrimping. You can always shrimp in the spot as well. Just don't move your butt backwards. Just move it side to side. Let's switch to outside inside on the ladder. He's going to go nice and low if he's feeling warm. He's going outside, inside, outside, inside. If his joints aren't warm, he goes a little higher. And he's just, again, just getting that body moving, feeling how you go. On your way back, alternate between your monkey crawl, your reverse crab walk, or your shrimping. I'm going to show you guys how to shrimp at home while he's doing that in the background. So I'm here, I'm bridging up, bridging to my left shoulder, sticking my butt up in the air. That would be a shrimp. Keeping the shoulders here and shrimping up. I'm going to let Chris pass so he gets his warm up in, right? And he's back to that outside inside, right? Depend on how many times that he's done that right, is what's going to help you. Remember, our idea of our warm-up is not to get a workout in, but to get some fluid moving in our joints so that we can train today. Whether we're training by ourselves, or we're training with our partner. Ideally, he alternated from monkey crawl, reverse crab walk, and shrimping. If he didn't, that's cool. You might mess it at home too. We're going to switch to what's called replacement step. So he's on the outside, inside for two. Left foot, middle two, right foot. Left one, two, right one, two. Left one, two, right one, two. Left one, two, right one, two. He's monkey crawling on the way back. He's gonna alternate between that monkey crawl, reverse crab walk, and that shrimping. How do you practice your replacement step at home? Go in your fighting stance, replace your foot, rear foot to front foot, front foot goes forward. C step back so you can train it the other way. Rear foot to front foot, front foot goes forward. He's doing his reverse crab walk. You can be practicing at home. When you're doing that, try and go nice and quick if you can. If you feel like this is too easy for you, always do it backwards. You can learn how to spin around with it. Lots of different things that you guys can be doing at home. You can even just do a core workout. But what I want you focusing on is the footwork because today our footwork is so important. That looks good to me. Okay, so let's get into our footwork. So we're in our stance. In order to have good footwork, we must have a good stance. I don't want you to have too narrow of a stance. I don't want you to have too wide of a stance, okay? So if your toe lines up to your heel and you drew a line from your big toe to your big toe, you're less than 45 degrees, okay? So that means you're in a wide stance. Pull that rear foot a little bit further than you think and it will give you stability for your circle strikes and your straight strikes, okay? When we're here, let's warm up with our pivoting. So our left foot's gonna pivot, then our right foot's gonna pivot. So notice, as my left foot goes to pivot, I go back to my neutral stance. So one, and then two. As time goes on, we can pivot together, right? But just one at a time when you guys are learning, 
You might be left foot forward right now. Let's switch. Right foot goes forward. Again, feel that pivot, feel that pivot. Pivot your body, rear foot, front foot. Move those hips, use that core, move your shoulders, keep the head forward, okay? Don't even worry about your hands if you're focusing on your feet. If you can do both, great job. Switch again. So we're in that left foot forward stance. If you're by yourself, this is how we're gonna train how to move basically. Let's bring our hands up now. I want you to think that you're at a kicking position. This is your boxing position where your hands are on your face. You're in the pocket, okay? If you're not in the pocket because you're at kicking range, your hands are off your face. My fist is in front of my face. My hand ideally is touching my face. It can be off the face if you so choose. Just don't like it down, okay? Hands are always up. When I'm moving to the left, my left foot moves first, then my right foot. When I'm moving to the right, my right foot moves first, then my left foot. I move backwards, back foot, then front foot. When I move forward, front foot, back foot. Let's create some good habits with our hands now. Kind of pat the head, rub the belly idea. I move left, still at kicking range. Move right, still at kicking range. Move back, still at kicking range. If not, I've increased my range, so I don't have to move my hands. This is the key one. When I move forward, my hands come to my face. Let's switch sides, train on the other side. Right lead, hands are up, moving to the right, right foot, then left foot. Moving to the left, left foot, right foot. Moving back, back foot, front foot. Moving forward, front foot, back foot. Let's get our hands involved. Hands are up, moving to the right, right, left. Kicking range, moving left, left, right. Kicking range, moving back, back, front. Kicking range, moving forward, hands come to the face. Let's switch sides. So let's add in a punch while we move forward because that's why we're here, we're here to train. So we fire that jab. So my hands are up. As I go to step forward, my left leg steps, my left hand fires a punch, step and punch, let that right leg come forward, touch, and now we're in a good stance. So we're here, let's step back, back to our kicking range. Stepping forward, one, two, we're in our stance. When you're doing this at home, if you choose to practice more, get that nice and fast. Let's do a little fast, ready? And one, two, get that foot there. Let's switch sides because we gotta train both sides. Slow-mo first, right foot, right hand, left foot comes forward. Reset again, one and two. One more time fast, one, two. Work on getting that feet there. Switch back to that left lead. We're gonna add in the cross punch now. So stepping glide, jab, touch, and cross. Reset, so that's one, two, three, slow-mo. One, two, three. Reset, keep those hands on the face, and one, two, three. Nice and fast now, ready, and Boom, all in one motion, switch sides. We're right lead. One, two, cross, reset. One, two, three, reset. Nice and fast. Boom, make that happen nice and quick. Let's talk about our blocks, okay? So if I'm in nice and tight, I do what's called a wing cover. Chris is gonna show this for us. So he's facing me, he does switch feet for me. He does his wing cover with his right hand. Exactly. So he slides all that beautiful hair back. He's protecting the back of his head, his elbows in, protecting from here. He's going to do a double wing cover. So the other hand comes up. Ideally, his elbows are touching. His chin's up a little bit because these things are going to be smashing my face. I can't hit him here. I can't hit him here. He's got the good defense. Yes, this is open, but this is a computer that we need. Okay. So those are your wing cover blocks. Okay, a jamming forearm block, I'll just show it to you quick. He goes to block it, freeze right there, freeze right there. This is the position that he wants to be in. Okay, so your arms are greater than 90 degrees. You're using your ulna bone, so your pinky side bone, to be able to do the block itself. Let's train it by yourself in the mirror, or sorry, by ourselves, or if you have a mirror, works great. Biggest thing here is you're turning the hip, using that pivot. So we pivot and block and reset to our stance kicking range. They throw that punch and we block. They throw that punch, block. They throw that punch, block. Let's add in a hook punch with it. They throw the punch, block. Left hand or lead hand turns into the hook punch and hit. Again, reset and block, hook, reset. One more time, kicking range, block, hook. We're good, let's switch sides. Practicing the block on this side, coming from a left hand from our attacker if they're in a right leg forward stance, and block, 
reset. Notice how I'm stepping into each one and blah. Reset. Chris isn't stepping. That means his reaction is a little sore. That's totally cool. You might be at that level. Ready? And block. Let's throw that hook punch now. Lead hand. Turn to the hook and smash. Again. Block. Hook. Reset. This has to be done fast. So block. Hook. Fast. Block. Hook. You got it. Okay? You should be nice and warm to be able to train your ass off. One of the most common attacks you're going to see in a self-defense, really a fight situation, Okay, is the old haymaker punch. Okay, so what is a haymaker punch? Just think of it like a circular strike. If I'm going to hit Chris, a lot of people throw the haymaker because they think it's going to generate more power. So his hands are down. They're just kind of swinging like the old anvil throw. They're throwing and they're trying to hit. This is where actually typically a lot of people break their hands to when they actually punch a human skull because their hands are in a weird position. So this isn't like a good boxing hook punch or anything like that. This is just that wild swinging punch that we tend to see. Number one thing that we want to be looking at here is understanding our range. If I have excellent timing and I see the attack coming, that's going to determine what I do. So what do I mean by that? He throws that haymaker at me and I'm able to step in and do something. That's the best possible timing. I'm waiting patiently, he goes to cock something back, I see him cock it back, and immediately I can move in and take away a lot of his power. He's gonna be strongest at the end of that strike. Notice how the distance changed. If I'm in closer, this makes things better. The first thing that we're gonna be looking at here though is your typical karate block, or let's just call it hard energy versus hard energy. He's throwing the attack at me, I'm blocking it with hard energy. So he goes to a throw. Let's talk about our block here first. My rear hip has to be facing the center of where my heart is. So don't think that you can block this with one hand and chop unless you're way bigger than they are. Okay, so let's always train, even though I'm bigger than Chris, like I'm the smallest person. I turn my hip, I'm pivoting my foot, my elbow's in, I'm past 90 degrees in this elbow here. Because if this, if you come to this side, if this elbow is bent in like this, this is a weak block, a weak structural position. I need to have that greater than 90 degrees. I'm trying to block with my forearm, technically my ulna muscle. I don't want to be blocking with this part. That's going to hurt quite a bit. His radius bone here, if I strike it, cause a little bit of pain, but it ain't going to stop it. Okay. My other hand, if they're way bigger, can just go to the arm itself. Okay. So again, think like double forearm chop. When I do this in my kids program, they can actually stop like a grown man's punch with this. It's what we do afterwards that now we're going to talk self-defense. With some training, this right hand eventually can come up to here. Don't think like judo chop, awesome power strike, he falls down, <laughs> not really realistic. So it's more so I'm just putting something on him. From this point here, I'm worried about his left hand. Usually what you end up seeing is people swing and they go swing and they swing again. Okay. So as he throws, I'm here. I'm worried about that other hand. This is where my boxing comes into play. My hand can cover my head, cover my face, right? But really as I'm throwing this, I'm trying to hit him before the hand hits me. So when this is up here, if I'm really close, like I'm just at 90 degrees here, when I go to turn, now I'm looking at my elbow, but we're really close on this. So if you're choosing to throw that counter, I recommend always trying to punch to the spine. Send him away so that that fist cannot do anything. So if he throws here and I just clip him like this, that punch can still come and hit me and it's whoever's gonna hit it faster and have more power is going to win that fight. So I don't even necessarily have to like hit him hard. I really just need to move him away. So the reaction here is I'm getting my blog and I'm just turning and just trying to send him away. Remember, we're just trying to build a response. The first one that we're building here is hard versus hard. If, switch feet please, he throws from that lead hand punch and I'm in what's called a partner C stance, so his right leg is forward and my left leg is forward. If he goes to throw that, throw hard please, right here, my balance can be taken away from me a little bit, right? So depending on how they throw is gonna really determine what I do. That's why it's so important, switch feet, 
that while we're doing this, we're building a good block. So he's here, boom, timing's good. I step in, train that a whole bunch. He again goes, bang, boom. Now I fire my strike. Maybe I'm in closer, bang, boom. I hit that elbow again here. Maybe I step and just send him away right away. That last one's a little bit more advanced. I'm only gonna talk about it real quick. Watch my feet. I'm stepping in, my foot steps through him. So a little Wing Chun footwork for you there. He's here and I'm through. I'm not worried about striking him at that point. I'm just like a bulldozer coming through it. Okay, we're dealing with that haymaker again, but this time they're way bigger. This is actually what I teach in my kids program is teaching them to be able to duck underneath it. Okay, so now we're saying hard energy versus soft energy. So he goes to throw that strike at me, I duck. Number one thing, right? Like worst case scenario, I stand there and I take it. Second case scenario, he throws it and at least my hands are up and I get a little defense, right? So let's start making things a little bit better. He throws again and now I just duck. The nice thing about the haymaker right now with his left foot back, sorry, left foot forward, my left foot forward is it's coming from his back or his rear hand. This should, in theory, if you look at me, you can see that coming more than if my right leg's forward and I throw here. So it's just a distancing because the hip and the shoulder are gonna open up. In theory, this should allow me to move. So as he goes to throw that, I'm now gonna step, cutting an angle as I'm ducking. I find my stance, look at my stance, I've angled off. He's at zero degrees, I'm at 90 degrees, I don't even have to punch him, I can simply push him before he squares up to me. If you understand timing in the boxing world though, it's not very likely. Slow-mo, we do this. He throws the strike. I duck and I step. From here, as I take my right step back, he can move his right leg back. And now we're back to even, right? So if he's drunk, maybe he'll be a little slower, but that's never gonna be a guarantee. So in order for you to get good at this and create a counter, he fires at me. Maybe I hit one low first. This isn't going to finish the strike, but at least it's going to give me one point, him zero. I'm not getting hit. As I go to step back here, let's say that that injured him a little bit by hitting him into the ribs, just a little, right? When I go and step, now I might fire before that hand comes out. But now let's go back to what we were talking about. I'm smaller, he's bigger. Have I trained enough with my punches that I trust that my fist is going to do that job? Self-defense world, I'm responding. He throws a punch at me. Holy shit, my training kicked in. I'm here. Cool. What other training do you have, right? Watch my range on that last one. He threw that. I'm a little far away. Maybe I throw the old dick kick. Maybe I try and push him away. There's a lot of different things that can happen right? Maybe I'm used to boxing. I'm in tight and I can definitely hit at that range, right? Maybe I just had a reaction. I'm like, ah, and I just push him with my footwork. There are so many things here. What we're trying to think about though, soft energy versus hard energy. I'm not trying to fight him per se. I'm trying not to get hit. Maybe I'm with my family. He throws and I'm like, ah, buddy, I don't want to do this. I told you I don't want to do this. What? Now I hit him it's time for me to do something. Okay, hard energy versus hard energy again, but this time I'm not blocking a thing, okay? I'm just putting my wing covers up. So what's a wing cover? I take my hand, I protect the back of my head, I tuck everything in, protecting my jaw, protecting my ear, hopefully protecting my temple, and I suck all that in. I do that with both hands. Your goal here is to be able to touch your elbows together. For some of you guys, your elbows may not touch together, right? Just make sure that you're defending enough that a fist can't fit in the middle, right? Because they might fake it and throw straight, right? Your goal here, if he throws his punch, if he will come up, freeze, is going to be his beautiful face. So if we come to this side, what are we looking at? What are we going to hit? Okay, I'm just going to use one elbow so you can see my pretty face, right? So I'm here, I'm driving forward. I had one Muay Thai instructor say, put your elbow into his teeth, right? So if his mouth is open, right? Just imagine that driving into there, that's gonna open his mandible, it might pinch his mandibular process. That right there may cause a knockout, not very likely, but it's gonna hurt a whole bunch, okay? 
Maybe I'm a little shorter and the elbow goes and hits to the collarbone, maybe to the neck, maybe he's defending himself, maybe it's hitting to the nose. Ideally, we're not hitting that forehead, but really what am I trying to do? I'm trying not to get hit. This one requires excellent timing because if he throws a punch and I just take it, at least I blocked, good enough, right? Kind of like a holy shit response, like, ah! And that came up, cool, it might work. Let's use some forward look at my feet real quick here. He's throwing something circular. Don't throw, sir. I'm stepping in. So when I step in as a martial artist, front foot, then back foot. Make sure you guys remember that. We call it a step and glide in our academy. I'm bringing my hands up from my defensive position, right? He goes to throw his strike. And boom, I'm just coming forward. Please be careful when you guys are training at home with this. If you notice, I want Chris to be able to work tomorrow. I'm driving my triangle right here beside him. In real life scenario, triangle goes right at that mouth, right at a center line, no matter if his chin is down or not. I'm just going full force into there. Okay, one more time he fires. Right, what do I do at that point? Maybe I hit, maybe I hit, maybe I don't, right? I'm really hoping that what I call double wing cover, double elbow eight is going to get that job done. Okay, similar to the last video, right? Now it's again that same idea of what's faster, something circular or something straight. If I'm at point A and he's, his face is at point B, he takes the circle route. It's therefore longer than my straight line. Simple math and geometry. So what am I doing? I'm stepping in. Okay, let's say perfect timing. I see him go to cock his punch back. He throws, I throw, I hit him before he hits me. That works great if I, one, have great timing. Two, if my arms are longer than his, that's going to give me a better chance of hitting him before he hits me. But what do they say? You're usually 0.5 of a second behind when you're reacting to something. Right, so now we're kind of in this dangerous world. I'm still moving in, he might be moving in, lots going on. So how do we guarantee that we can hit without taking too much damage? So slow-mo, he throws the punch, I'm going to strike. And if you notice here, it kind of bounced off my shoulder. That's what I'm looking for. My shoulder protected my jawline, okay? So normally when I throw a jab, right, I can throw it straight. If I throw it like a boxer, become the turtle, roll it over and protect your jaw. So your shoulder will protect that. So when I'm in close here, I'm trying to protect. This might come up and deflect off, but ideally my shoulder is taking the damage. In the best case scenario, I'm hitting him before that is happening. Notice how I switched to a palm strike here because if you haven't trained martial arts a lot, if you go to hit with your knuckles, you might break your hand. You got to work the next day, right? So you can switch the palm strike. What do we lose by switching to a palm strike? If you take a look from the side, my fist can hit him now, whether it's like this or this, my palm cannot. So your fist will give you range. If you have really short arms, you can always go to fingers, okay? You're probably going to break a finger though, to be honest. It might be worth it to you, though, if you don't want to take that punch. Again, I'll leave the choice up to you. So it all comes down to time. What is a good rule of thumb, though, here is as he goes to throw that strike, is I'm here, I'm jamming that. Now what do I do? I hit. One hits, second one hits. Did you guys notice what Chris did there as a new K, whether he knew it or not? He tried to throw it higher because he knew what I was going to do. So that actually punch deflected off the top of me. If that punch was coming again and it came to here, I wouldn't have to do anything, right? If somebody's throwing that punch, they should be aiming right at that jawline if they know what they're doing. If they don't know what they're doing, they're just trying to hit a big circle, so be it. That's what just happened there. Definitely wouldn't have taken damage there. So again, he throws, boom, right? I get my coverage. Boom, and I hit just a little faster for you. I'm in, bang, bang, and I go to hit. Look what happened on that one. As that punch came forward, this came here, and again, because he didn't want to take my palm to his face, he actually moved his head a little to the side. My hand hit, deflected off, and became more of like a clinch. From this point here, it's very easy for me to strike him. Close my eyes. You can always punch your hand. 
So there's a lot of different things that will take place with your uke, whether Chris knows it or not. It doesn't matter. That's kind of the realism of some training that you get. So on that one, timing is imperative, making sure that you can get to him before he gets to you, right? If you're way off on the timing and he throws it, that might just save you there. But look at the range. It would have never hit me. If he steps in to throw it, boom, there's my shoulder. Ooh, that one's close to tempo. He might hurt me a little bit there, right? Watch what happens when I turn that shoulder over. Now I'm a little bit more safe. So these are all things you don't have to train really fast or hard. You just got to be able to practice it. Stay safe. Okay, what is a reactionary gap? What is your safe space in martial arts, both for sparring, but you're here for self-defense? Where, where are you going to feel the most safe, right? In the martial arts world, if he's in a fighting stance and I'm in a fighting stance, the taller person, that's me, rear leg kick. Boom, see, I could just hit his belt. I would have to really thrust my hips forward to be able to hit him, and even then I can barely hit him, guys. I know that because I know my range. Right? I know that because I've kicked for many years. I know that if I can hit him, he can't hit me. So this is going to be his safe space or his reactionary gap. If we're not in the martial arts world, and we're both just kind of standing here before things are getting heated, we're kind of in this verbal, kind of verbal judo world right now, right? Is you don't want to engage, but you're starting to see maybe he's clenching his fist. Maybe he's starting to take a step forward into a stance. Maybe he's raising his hands and getting angry like, well, okay, we know something's about to go down. So the number one thing here is if he's in his stance and he comes into here, if he goes to take a step forward at me, I just take a step back. Very simply stated, okay? If I step forward, he could step back. Okay, let's look at that because that's super important. Great martial arts training there. But in the self-defense world, if this guy goes to throw up his hands and I go to step forward and he takes a step back, run, he's already showing that he might be a little bit intimidated and that he doesn't want to get hit, so he's stepping back. If he's stepping back, he's not trying to hurt you. If he's not trying to hurt you in that moment, that's buying you time. Time is everything in the self-defense world, so it's time for you to get away. Whether you're protecting your family, and I change things a little bit. If I'm with my family and I know it takes them, say, 20 seconds to get back to the car and this guy approached me, I might have to hold my ground a little here. So you might see me step forward, he steps back, I step forward again, I'm just buying my family time, okay? So he's probably got some training. If he's moving like that, the fight's not done by any means. But if you can run, I always suggest to run. It's just the safest thing out there. So this reactionary gap gives you time. In the self-defense world, in my program, if he fires that jab at me, I step off to the side, okay? I could do a whole bunch of other things. I'm just giving you basic step one. He fires the cross at me, I step to the side, okay? He fires the kick at me, I step to the side. He fires the roundhouse kick at me, I can step to the side or I can block it. He fires the hook punch at me, I can check and I can block. He fires the rear hook at me, I can duck and I can move. But what did you notice? Everything I did there was built off of reaction, reactionary gap. This is one drill I like to train with my students. Nice and slow, they enter with a jab cross. Okay, our first drill, he would duck and fire a cross hook uppercut. In the second drill, he enters with a jab cross and he would slip and he would return with cross jab cross. So right away, reaction versus anticipation, he has to know which one is coming. That's making him react. So even though we're doing mid drills, he's learning to react right away. You have to build that into your self-defense. Don't anticipate they're going to do something. React to what it is they're doing and your training should kick in. In the self-defense world, this is very important because what does it look like from you guys right now? right? He goes to fire that jab at me. I'm here. I don't want to fight. He looks like the aggressor. I look like I'm trying to defend myself. And if he won, he fires that jab, right? I'm here. And if he gets hit, that's his fault. That's up to him. He tried to hurt me. That should be defendable in court. If you jump on top of him and start smashing him until he's a bloody pulp, well, you deserve to go to jail because you got issues. But in that point there, he's the aggressor. I'm the defender. 
I've definitely built my system for Canadian law, but I did so so that it can be used all around the world because we're soft like that. Stay safe out there.